Good afternoon, everyone. This is Pete Gilfillan at IMN, and I'd like to thank you for joining us again. I'm delighted to welcome you to this virtual fireside chat with Francis Greenberger, Chairman and CEO of Time Equities, and I'm very happy to first introduce Lisa Nee, partner at Eisner Amper, who will be talking with Francis for the next 20 minutes or so. Thank you very much, Lisa. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lisa Nee, and I'm the co-chair of Eisner Amper's Real Estate Services Group. We at Eisner Amper are focused on helping clients respond to the pandemic and its impact on the real estate market in every sector through a wide array of advisory and accounting services, including debt advisory, property level accounting, and construction financial oversight. I'm honored and thrilled to be hosting today's fireside chat with the iconic American real estate developer, literary agent, author, philanthropist, activist, found and founder of Time Equities Inc., Art Omni Inc., and the Greenberger Center for Social and Criminal Justice, Francis Greenberger. Francis, welcome. What an honor, privilege, and pleasure to have you here today. Well, Lisa, you're too nice. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's an honor to be with you. Thank you. And, and, and all the people who are listening. Great. So you have said, and this is definitely music to an accountant's ears, that real estate is all about deal making based on whether the numbers make sense. So what are the critical success factors for making a new real estate development? Well, I, I think they're, uh, they're objective ones and they're subjective ones. Objectively, you have to aim at the right target and you have to use the right assumptions going in and you have to leave enough uh, elbow room for your assumptions to vary from where you think they might end up. Um, generally, in uh, in development projects, excuse me for that. Um, we at, we sort of our target is what we call a two x return on the uh, on the equity including any pref equity in the project. So in simple terms, if the project's 100 million and we have 60 million in debt and we're putting 40 million in equity in, we would like it to make 80 million or 40 million gain and we're all set. So that's the, 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 the numerical target, so to speak. And sometimes you might decide to go ahead at 1.9 X or 1.8. But the second all important thing is that in any development budget and pro project, you've got a million variables. So, you know, if you push the numbers the wrong way or make the wrong assumption, you can easily get to a multiple that looks acceptable, but isn't real. So you have to be the, the care and the scrutiny in really uh, understanding the numbers is critical to come to the, to the, to the right, uh, uh, conclusion. And then no matter how accurate you are, you have to be prepared for variances that are unanticipated, not anticipated. You know, interest rates are a simple one. Who can tell what interest rates are going to be for the next three years? Um, and all down the line. So you need broad reserves and contingencies in the budget. If you do all those things and you do them well, then you'll have a chart chance of landing at your target or close enough to it that you won't be hurt. But if you're off, uh, then, uh, um, but if, if you don't have the right discipline, you don't have the right numbers, you can easily find yourself in a completely different financial picture than you anticipated. Right, so just picking up on that var variables and unknown, and this is a distressed commercial real estate forum, right? So would you mind talking about your experiences working on a project under construction during an economic downturn, specifically the construction of the 64 story residential tower at 50 West uh, Street during the global financial crisis? And now sort of that mirror story that you're experiencing that it's 74 story tower at 1000 South Michigan Avenue in Chicago, which is right in the midst of a pandemic. So talk about those variables. Sure, sure. So at 50 West, uh, we we had we had started the foundation, and I mean just started, right as the world financial crisis hit. And um, uh, in the beginning, as is not totally unusual, 
we hadn't yet fully secured uh, the capital stack, and we were beginning on a uh, with 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 enough equity and debt just to do the foundations, with the rest to follow. And um, uh, but seeing what was going on in the world uh, with financial institutions cratering overnight, it seemed uh, um, completely wrong to be proceeding. And even though we went before it all hit, we had sort of tentatives on our financing package. It wasn't, we were just speculating. And so I quickly came to the decision that this is not the right time to be building. And I stopped the foundation uh, after we had gotten, you know, uh, probably, I don't know what, two, three, five million dollars in the ground. Um, stop, wait. That was a big and complex decision, needless to say. Um, the next thing that happened is the wait turned out to be a lot longer than, than we were because the crisis was deep and, and long. And uh, so we had to sit there for, I think three years or something before we could restart. And uh, all the time we um, were having to carry the project which even though we had stopped it was still about 3 million a year in interest and carrying costs. So uh, I always say, uh, make hay while the sun shines, but carry a large umbrella. And what, what that means, umbrella is a euphemism for money so that you can find, pay your way out of your mistakes. Um, not in a stupid way, but in, a, in, in, a, with, in an intentional way. Um, the next thing that happened was we realized that as the financing markets were reassembling themselves, um, uh, this originally was conceived as a hotel base with luxury apartments above. And the market to finance hotels is very different from the market to finance condominiums. Right. And there are different lenders who are interested in different things and they work in different cycles. So what we found was that there were people willing to talk to us about the condominium side of it, who had no interest in the hotel. And the hotel side, the market wasn't recovering at the same rate. And it was very hard to find um, lenders who would be interested in the hotel at all, or that, and certainly to find lenders interested in both was almost an impossibility. So we, uh, uh, um, we scratched our heads and we decided that the only way that we could hope to get this done in the foreseeable future or in the immediate environment was to get rid of the hotel and make it an all condominium building. Even though originally we thought the combination would, be, uh, um, would result in, 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 in a better economic uh, package, but we had, to, we had to pivot in the middle of because of conditions and, and the recovery market uh, um, did not have the same appetite for hotels as condominiums. So we got rid of the condominium, we redesigned the whole building, which unfortunately met, you know, it sounds easy, I'll get the hotel, put a few more apartments down below. You know, once you change plans even a little bit, right. you end up ripping them up and we're talking about millions of dollars in design. So we had to absorb that, but uh, um, you know, when you're building a five hundred million dollar project, you know if you have to throw away five million dollars in the garbage can because it's no longer viable, you have to do it. So that's the pivot that we made, and since the building is there today, uh, you can tell that the, that the revised plan worked. It was what the, what the market was ready for at the time. It's what the financiers were, what the bank were ready for and we were able to put the package together and build at what turned out to be an opportune time just sort of as the recovery was beginning there was little product in the market because nobody had been building for three years so we both had a uh, undersupplied market as well uh, uh, with pent-up demand which was ideal and we did very well uh, selling uh, um, uh, as we were coming out of the ground um, so that's a little bit of history. Now let's flash to 1000 Michigan and Chicago where we're in the middle of 
pre-development on a 74 story building. And there, as we went into the pandemic crisis, we were at exactly the same place. We'd started to work on the foundation. We'd been pre-selling and we had sold about 100 condominium units out of 400 and some odd. Uh, we had lined up certain aspects of the financing, but we hadn't finalized the, um, uh, we, we had a found again, find out financing through foundation, but not for the, uh, for the rest of the building, even though uh, we were in ex advanced discussions with lenders. So we had to pivot again. And there, what we identified as the problem was that the market was telling us that um, uh, middle priced condominiums were selling, but the most luxurious, the most expensive, the best apartments that were part of our plan uh, were not finding demand, at least in that marketplace. So although we had sold 100 units pre-construction, pre which is pretty good, um, they weren't at the right price points. So that was bothering us. And the market went, you know, condominiums are, uh, again, it's a very particular uh, financing market. Lenders are either in the mood for them or they're not, and some lenders won't touch them. Rentals are seen as much easier to finance because lenders feel the uh, lease up is more predictable. So we pivoted again. We ripped up a few million dollars in plans and we relaunching it as a rental. We went from 400 and some odd units to 700. Um, same building, outside looks exactly the same, but inside the layouts are different. Um, so that one's not finished yet, but we're making a lot of progress on the financing side and we're hopeful of being in the ground this year. And we're hopeful, but by the time this comes on the market, the world will have recovered from, from the pandemic and uh, will be in the right place at the right time. And again, supply is being uh, um, constricted right now because not too many people were starting projects as the pandemic uh, went on. Definitely not. And so you mentioned pivoting a lot um, through that whole story. And so are there investments today that you're evaluating that you probably wouldn't have looked at at all pre-pandemic? Absolutely. Um, uh, uh, we, what part of what happened in the pandemic is counterintuitive. Um, certain product types, actually, we saw cap rate compression, mm -hmm. um, multifamily, because it was kind of the obvious marketplace. Uh, uh, the the, the uh, p homes became more valuable as people spent more time in them. And there were things happening uh, that were... Uh, um, uh, the unintended consequences of the pandemic, uh, but weren't directly uh, involved. And we're using one of them right now. Uh, this period to me is the post Zoom period, as opposed to necessarily the post pandemic period. And that has all kinds of implications on, on the use of real estate. Um, so that has to be factored in. And then uh, um, retail, we saw an acceleration in e-commerce. Uh, so retail also had to be we thought, and, and, uh, and the pandemic pushed certain marginal retailers into bankruptcy. So uh, anyway, as we're trying to make our, our way in the, all, all of this, uh, we started, we're, we're opportunistic by nature. So we look for different things that may uh, have a sh be undersupplied in terms of capital or investment demand so that we can get better margins than we might if we went into the most competitive markets. Um, and we found some interesting things that we hadn't really thought about. Credit markets were disrupted. As a result, people needed more bridge loans mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, like we, an example, we financed some industrial building where the buyer uh, had a bank loan all lined up. He was ready to close and it was a high, very high quality property that he needed for their own use. So they were even the tenant or the user. And the bank backed out in the last minute because of their issues. So they're sitting there looking to close and they needed money fast. So we together with a, uh, a lender partner went in and gave them a first mortgage. We took the B piece um, and this lender uh, 
liked having us because in case anything happened with this product, project, they didn't want to end up with it because they're not equipped to deal with it. But for us, we're in the real estate business, so we didn't know what to do. Anyway, that led to a series and we're now uh, um, uh, B peep spires in bridge loans. Uh, and we've done a number of them. Um, uh, and that's giving us very nice returns because with some lending sources shut out, uh, um, the market is hungry for capital in that area. We've never, we've never played that role before. We've never wanted to be a lender before, but now uh, we see that as an interesting opportunity. Um, another area that we went into, which was completely new for us, we've never been in the public markets uh, um, as a uh, trader in real estate securities. Uh, and we noticed that there was some, there was disruption in a very particular kind of real estate uh, um, security, and that's preferred stocks of public REITs. And uh, we saw that we could get double digit returns in some very high quality properties. We set up again in a joint venture with a hedge fund that we know well and who had great expertise in this area. We set up a standalone fund to trade in those things. And we started this last June and it's gone very, very well. We're well into double, double, double digit returns, which on an annualized basis would be in the mid twenties. Yeah. So that's worked out very well. And what we regarded as very safe securities um, with, with, with little downside. And, and, the, and, and another area that we recently went into is the alternative energy area. We're helping finance a wind, a large wind farm in Texas. Uh, and, um, you know, we've all heard uh, um, uh, the talk about, you know, what we need to do to, to fight climate change. We have to change our energy sources and new administration is very committed to that. And so are we. Uh, and financing wind farms turns out, it's not typical real estate, but it's not unrelated. It, it requires um, uh, very specific knowledge and expertise and it's um, uh, so we've, we've taken a large position in, in financing uh, this major wind farm in, in Texas. Um, so that's, again, something that's a little bit different. And the last thing we did was we uh, went, our, we, have a European, you know, we have a European portfolio, and we went into Scotland for the first time because we found uh, a very opportunistic purchase there. So constantly searching the world for, for what we regard as opportunistic investments that we feel comfortable with, that we feel are secure, not high risk. And, uh, um, and then we, then we go for it. So I want to make sure, and I can't believe our time here is almost wrapping up, but I, I want to end on a, a positive, although everything you've been talking about has been positive moments, but what are you most hopeful to see in the year ahead and, and any positive lessons or, or experiences that anybody can take from this year that we Well, have? the first thing that is um, compared to our dire thoughts uh, last as the pandemic was beginning and not knowing where the world was going, uh, I think the world has actually done better and, and we've seen it in our portfolio returns. They're, they're, they're outperforming our initial most conservative assumptions of what was gonna happen through, during the pandemic. So somehow the world has weathered it. Not been great, don't get me wrong. And there've been terrible, terrible things that have happened in terms of human yeah. life, et cetera. But somehow we're still here. And, uh, um, uh, and you know, who would have thought the stock market? I mean, who could believe it? Um, the next thing is that uh, um, I'm optimistic Mystic about the uh, um, uh, the end of the pandemic through the vaccine. I think that's going to, even though I know there are vaccine delivery problems, et cetera, I think that's going to phase in faster than people can imagine. And we're going to be looking at it, certainly by this fall, a very different world. And uh, um, I can already tell you that people that have gotten the vaccine so far, it's, you know, like, it's like, the sun came up uh, and as everybody gets access to the vaccine over the next few months, I think the sun's gonna come up on a lot of people and that's gonna be a lot of positive energy uh, that'll go into the economy and we'll see a, a forceful recovery. And hopefully get people back into New York. Very much so. Well, New York is missing, before the pandemic, we were running 
50 to 60 million tourists a year. I don't think you could find five tourists in New York right now. That's a lot of people to be missing. Um, uh, not with, and all the jobs and all the economic, you know, the restaurants. I mean, our, we don't have inside dining anymore. Uh, um, it's uh, um, New York is not New York right now. And, uh, but it will be soon, it will be soon. And we got a lot of, it's a world of hurt right now, but we've got a lot of, uh, we, have a, we have a long history of recovery and we've got a lot of recovering to do here. Absolutely. So unfortunately, I think our time, I, I have, as you know, I have a lot more questions that I could be asking you. And I know there's a lot more information that people wanna know. This was such a, a great honor today and, and a privilege to be sitting here with you. And I, I can't thank you for enough for taking your time and, and uh, sharing some of this insight with everybody. So thank you to, to you, Francis, and to IMN well, for my, letting my me. Ple my pleasure, Lisa, and thank you for, for being part of this and, and uh, asking all those good questions. <laughs> I have more, so. <laughs> okay, well, we can stay on after everybody goes. We'll let them go and, and we're gonna continue with our conversation. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much. I, I really would like to thank both Lisa and Francis for their time. I'm sure our audience members will agree that that was an intriguing discussion and we could have all listened for several more hours. I'm also very happy to hear that Time Equities have invested in my home country of Scotland. So as we would say, <laughs> Slanger. <laughs> um, so our next session beginning now, will address adaptive reuse and best practices in repositioning distressed assets. So please do join us through the agenda tab within Hub. So finally, once again, I'd like to thank Lisa and Francis for your time and we look forward to welcoming everyone to the next panel. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.